I don't really think she needs much introduction, but we will we'll give uh, an introduction anyway. <laughs> so yes. please. So um, I am gonna I'm gonna just say, uh, introduce Anne Goldstein. Um, and uh, Anne Goldstein unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, but uh, she is here <laughs> virtually. <laughs> so um, as you can see on the screen, and uh, so a little bio, a couple of words to say the immense work Anne Goldstein has done with translation. And not only translation, because she's an editor at The New Yorker. She has translated works by, among others, um, Elena Ferrante, Pierpaolo Pasolini, and Alessandro Baricco, uh, and is the editor of the complete works of Primo Levi in English. Um, and we have Domenico Scarpa here, so uh, he knows uh, some, uh, one thing or two about Primo Levi. Um, Goldstein has been the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship the Pen Renato Poggioli Prize, and awards from the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her translation of Ferrante's The Story of the Lost Child, La Storia della Bambina Perduta, was shortlisted for the 2016 Man Booker International Prize. But the most, one of the most important thing is that uh, Anne Goldstein has translated works by Isolo Calvino. And uh, I have, the book now I'm going to show it to you in a minute because like it's in my bag but like the book um, that um, the most recent book uh, that uh, Anne has translated is uh, Mondo Scritto in Mondo Scritto, the um, written world and the unwritten world. So without further ado we can start the interview and uh, um, yes. Brilliant. I just I just want to say I'm um, thank you all for coming and um, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. <laughs> Thank you for accommodating this. <laughs> We're very grateful that you could join us remotely anyway. Um, so um, maybe I could start off with a very basic question, which is um, just how did you uh, come to start engaging with the works of Isabel Calvino? Well, at, like most things, it was it was by chance. Um, actually, not so much by chance, but um, the Giovanna Calvino was organizing um, a new edition or supervising, I guess, a new edition of um, Calvino's work uh, by, I guess, I forget who the publisher is, Harper Collins. They're, they wanted to put out a uniform edition of all of Calvino's books. And there were certain gaps that needed to be filled in, as well as some things that had, a few things that hadn't been translated at all. So, um, so they, she asked me um, to do that, which was really kind of a shock because I, I hadn't really um, translated any Calvino and I'm certainly not a Calvino expert in any shape or form. So it was kind of an educational experience for me. And I am so completely grateful for having had that experience because I probably wouldn't have um, done any work on Calvino. So it was that's that was sort of the beginning of it. It but, doesn't make um, sense for you to translate, retranslate uh, Italo Calvino's work. Do you feel as a current, um, you know, this is the, the kind of work that you would have wanted to translate? Wait, I'm sorry. What is it? Yes. Can you just say that again? Sorry, it's not. It's not. And do you, do you feel that it makes sense nowadays, you know, for today's readers, translate or retranslate oh. Calvino's work? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, his work is always, he's such an interesting writer. Um, and in a sense, I mean, I, I haven't read a, a lot. Of, I mean, I haven't read a lot, but I, but the Calvino that I've read and that I've translated is such a range of, um, I don't know what you'd say, a range of language, a range of um, ideas, a range of everything that, um, you know, it's just, it's fascinating. And I think, every, you know, anybody would benefit by, I mean, of yeah. course, you know, it's interesting to read. <laughs> we all agree. <laughs> yeah. here. And so the first uh, book that you translated by Calvino, I don't probably just should go into this Calvino discussion straight away, but uh, the first book that you translated was The Baron in the Trees. Wasn't yeah, it? yes, it was. And that was the only book that was retranslated. Um, all the others um, in this new series or edition, I guess you would call it, um, were the old translation or the original translations, I think. And a lot of them were done by William Weaver and other, you know, sort of good, great translators. So there was sort of no need to retranslate everything. Um, but um, but Giovanna Calvino wanted to do The Baron in the Trees. And that was really exciting because that was the only, that was about the only Calvino I'd ever read. And it was, um, it was 
I just, I love that book. So it was really a pleasure to do. I mean, it's complicated. He's a very complicated writer, but, um, but it was, um, that was, that was interesting to do. And the other thing that, that I found interesting was um, the stories, the early stories from Last Came the Raven, um, which were uh, very um, much more, I think, um, personal. I mean, I don't mean necessarily autobiographical. I just mean they were more about, you know, people, ordinary people struggling. I mean, they're they're recognizably Calvino. This they've got that sort of like ironic tone, and um, people say funny things, and <laughs> but um, and have interesting thoughts, like the Baron in the trees. But um, but they're also like mo sort of moving in a different way. I mean, I think actually the Baron in the trees is a very moving book, but. These these short stories of some of the uh, about the war, some of them just about people struggling with life. Uh, I, I that was really surprising to me. That was most surprising. And so you got the full range of Calvino's. Uh, I do think that <laughs> you had the kind of more near realist, and then you had the fantastical Calvino or the magic. Yeah. You had the specific, very complex prose of the essays as well. So you experienced. Yeah. Well, Right. Yes. I mean, I haven't even mentioned, we haven't gotten to the essays yet. <laughs> There's a whole other <laughs> problem. <laughs> um, so, so you mentioned, um, as we quite often hear with from translators, that you arrived at Calvino, not maybe by mistake, but not through design either. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how you feel or what kind of impact do you feel he has gone on to have on your work, um, generally speaking? Well, I mean, I think that that I'm sure every translator would say this, you know, everything that you do has an impact on your work because you see the language used in a different way. And that's always useful to, to your next translations is to have an idea of um, both vocabulary. I mean, you know, in some ways vocabulary is one of the big things you see words used differently or different meanings of words, but also, you know, just the structure of, of the sentences or the, the way of the ways of thinking. I mean, it's always, it's just, it's always um, broadening of your, uh, of your work to, to trans, whoever you're translating, you know, even if it's something that's not that congenial. I mean, in the beginning, I really didn't feel that Calvino, I was, Calvino and I were very congenial, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, you become involved. <laughs> in the in the person's um yeah, this is very mind. <laughs> I'm sorry this is very interesting now we I have to ask you who do you feel uh, as congenial writer that you have translated well I mean I mean someone like Ferrante was immediately congenial to me uh or um actually the writer I've been working on a lot now Alba de Cespedes also I felt was almost immediately Congenial, even though De Cespedes, for example, is a very, you know, is from another time. And Ferrante is, I mean, I'm, she's sort of contemporary. I mean, whoever she is, uh, mm -hmm. she's some somewhat, I imagine that she's somewhat my contemporary. So, you know, that that's that's an immediately congenial kind of thing, at least. But I'm not saying that other writers don't become congenial. <laughs> of course, yes, yes. Yeah, no, I understand completely that. Yeah. But you were attracted more to Ferrante and to Alba de Cespedes kind of work and style, I suppose, you know, but um, yeah. Calvino then was, um, I suppose, um, uh, very involving too. In the, in oh, totally. Yeah, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect. Um, so, um, yeah, like um, going to uh, the, the, I don't know if we wanted to go to the essays, um, Maybe we just like go there and start going there very <laughs> gradually. <laughs> um, how uh, do you feel or there was, was there any difference um, in translating uh, The Baron in the Trees, for example, or the short stories and uh, the experience of translating is translating the essays? What was the difference? Well, essays, first of all, are really different from, um, from fiction. I mean, they're, they, Especially these, in particular, these essays, which are a lot of them are based are particular to their moment or to their time or their, you know, like as you, their book reviews or their essays in response to somebody else's essay. So they required a lot of research, 
I mean, fiction also requires a certain amount of research, um, you know, like the names of the trees, for example, in the Baron and the Trees. But um, but but the research of this in this book was really of a different order. I mean, there were a lot of things like, um, let me see if I can just, um, well, they're they're of they're meant very much of their time, and these essays range from the I guess from the fifties to the eighties, and some of them are about obscure subjects, some of them are about literary movements, um, which were hard to um, to pin down. You know, or do these do these literary movements have English equivalents? Do they not? Do they have? Are they called something particular in English? You know, you want to get that right. You want to have the, the right English version of something. I mean, we discuss this. Um, for example, the the one about in which he mentions both Danunzianesimo and Pirandellesimo, <laughs> but it turns out that Danuncio, Danuncianesimo has an English is called that in English, and whereas Pirandellesimo it doesn't exist in English. So you know what do you you know it's hard to know how to deal with those terms and and whether and which which side are you going to be consistent on? Are you going to be consistent on what sounds consistent or are you going to be consistent on what the use the English usage is so there were a lot of many very many small decisions I don't even know if you would call them practical or mechanical but requiring both um, research and thought and consultation with other with with scholars because I'm not a scholar I mean I'm not an academic and I'm not a you know in any sense of the word so I remember another word that had me stumped for a while was um uh, fantastico you know, is it fantasy? Is it the fantastic? What is it? And I, I did ask a bunch of American academics, um, people, um, not a bunch, but several American, and you know, they didn't necessarily agree. So, that, so that was really, you know, you just at some point you just have to make this decision. But, but essays require a lot of decisions like that that um, that fiction doesn't. Yes, and and then and uh, it, it's interesting. It's funny how you mentioned. That there was no agreement um, among academics and something that often happens but, uh, <laughs> but agreement among academics about the use of a certain term that is a sign that that term was in fact a controversial one it was a hard one you know to um, uh, um, translate into a different culture you know, there were reasons right. cultural reasons for for, for that difficulty yeah. term but you did a great job so oh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And, and and of course there was also the matter of footnotes. Yeah, well, we decided in the beginning. I decided with the editors that we weren't going to do footnotes. So I mean, in a way, it makes life easier, but in a way, it makes life more difficult because there are so many. Um, I mean, it's not just a question of translation of language, as you say. It's a it's a question of translation into culture of culture, and you can't um, assume anything about what the anglophone culture will know and not know about italian culture so that was also a, a little bit of a difficulty on the other hand there is the argument that people have access now to the internet and if there's something you don't know you can usually look it up not everything but many things um i mean i'm just thinking of this is a slightly off the subject but the essay about that's a response to an essay by this um, critic called Alberto, um, what's his name, Azor Rosa. I mean, I could not find that essay. So I was reading Calvino's response to the essay without um, without really knowing what the essay said. I think, I can't remember if I eventually found it. But um, anyway, it was, it's like, you know, what are you going to, you just have to do what you, make it, make the essay sound um, consistent within itself, even if you don't know everything that it's referring to. So there are all kinds of problems like that. <laughs> that must be quite unbuffing when you're aware that there's a conversation and you're reacting to part of it, but you don't know what came before. It must be exactly. Hard. Yeah. It must take right. a lot of emotional uh, awareness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's like walking the plank. <laughs> <laughs> Over an abyss. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have one of the texts from your essay? Yes, that you'd like um, to yes. Um, I think uh, um, perhaps uh, Anne, would you like to read um, a first passage or one of the passages that we sure. had 
Okay. okay. Oh, yeah, I was going to read the um, just the beginning few paragraphs from the written world. The, there's an essay called The Written World and the Unwritten World, um, which I think was a lecture originally, uh, if I remember. Uh, so, so okay. yes, it was the written world and the unwritten world. Yeah, yeah. one of those yeah. yeah. Um, I belong to that portion of humanity, a minority on the planetary scale, but a ma majority, I think, among my public that spends a large part of its waking hours in a special world, a world made up of horizontal lines where the words follow one another one at a time, where every sentence and every paragraph occupies its set place. A world that can be very rich, maybe even richer than the non-written one, but that requires me to make a special adjustment to situate myself in it. When I leave the written world to find my place in the other, in what we usually call the world, made up of three dimensions and five senses, populated by billions of our kind, that to me is equivalent every time to repeating the trauma of birth, giving the shape of intelligible reality to a set of confused sensations and choosing a strategy for confronting the unexpected without being destroyed. This new birth is always accompanied by special rights that signify the entrance into a different life. For example, the right of putting on my glasses since I'm nearsighted and read without glasses, while for the farsighted majority, the opposite right is imposed, that is of taking off the glasses used for reading. Every rite of passage corresponds to a change in, member, in mental attitude. When I read, every sentence has to be readily understood, at least in its literal meaning, and has to enable me to formulate an opinion. What I've read is true or false, right or wrong, pleasant or unpleasant. In ordinary life, on the other hand, there are always countless circumstances that escape my understanding, from the most general to the most banal. I often find myself facing situations in which I wouldn't know how to express an opinion, in which I prefer to suspend judgment. While I wait for the unwritten world to become clear to my eyes, there's always within reach a written page that I can dive back into. I hasten to do that with the greatest satisfaction. There, at least, even if I understand only a small part of the whole, I can cultivate the illusion of keeping everything under control. So there, in those two paragraphs, you have like a real microcosm of Calvino. I mean, there's the, the sort of visual, the practical, the, the written, the horizontal lines, but there's also like this abstraction and the slightly ironic, but, but also sincere. <laughs> tone. I mean, it's kind of amazing, actually. I, I just as I was reading that out loud, I was thinking, boy, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> One of the things that really strikes me is, um, uh, as you know, um, English tends to prefer sentence lengths that are somewhat shorter than yeah, Italian. For sure. And um, even so, here, the sentences are quite long, but they don't become cumbersome. And I was wondering whether that was, um, like, did you did you consciously say to yourself, "I I want to make my sentences um, of an, a similar length or the same length as Calvino, or did you, did it just flow how it flowed?" Do you remember? Um, it did flow how it flowed. I mean, I did. Of course, I try to keep everything in the same sentence that that's in the Italian, but I think it's impossible. Um, because, as you say, English just doesn't do those long sentences. I mean, doesn't doesn't contain those long sentences as well as Italian. You know, they just they just begin. You just lose track of where you are much more easily. I mean, English is, of course, is much less inflected. I mean, there's, you know, Italian verbs contain so much information, just a single verb. And English doesn't do that. You need three or four words to do that same verb. So you can't possibly in a way, maintain all the sentences. Um, I think there's a lot of Italian writing now that is using shorter sentences, not so much academic writing, but um, you know, fiction and, and other kinds of writing, uh, which is interesting. But in a way, I, I miss those. <laughs> I miss the long, elaborate Italian sentence. That to me is Italian <laughs> in a certain sense. Um, but um, yeah, anyway. I was just uh, um, also I, when reading this, um, a certain similarity of concept that is used here by Calvino when he talks about margins and Delena Perante, the, oh. the book of essays that you translated. Oh, uh, yeah. 
peccato, no? When she, Elena Ferrante says that um, she struggles to contain her style within the margins of the sentence. Well, here with Calvino, we see that probably he struggles, but he, he you know, like it doesn't show <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, there is boundaries between the written and the unwritten world, you know, like mm -hmm. in this case. But um, just wondering whether for you it's been a radically different experience translating Ferrante's essays and Calvino's essays, for example. Um, well, in some ways they're similar because they're different from the fiction. It's much, it's more difficult to me. I mean, more difficult in the sense that it's, um, well, there's more, as I said, there's more research, there are terms that you don't know and, and things like that, less so. Although in Ferrante, there was also, in those essays, there was a fair amount of, I mean, she makes references to many, many other writers and essays and, and works that, you know, I, I tried to um, look at at least. Um, but, but essays in general are, and this is true of Calvino too, are more dense than, um, than fic generally more dense than fiction. Uh, I mean, sentence, sentence by sentence, I guess I would say. And there's, you know, I felt that I was more, um, I don't know, they, they were just more, more. well, to go back to James's point, I mean, they were harder, it's harder, almost harder to contain the information in a single sentence that's in a single sentence in the Italian to contain it in English. So I think I probably um, broke up the sentences a bit more than I would in fiction. But um, but definitely there's a similarity of difference, if I can put it that way, between the fiction and the and the essays in both those writers. I mean, there of course there's obviously they're incredibly different writers, but but def but there's a similar um, similar difficulty in in prose and also in prose. I mean, you there's at least for me, I think I mean in not in prose in in essays. I mean, there's a certain clarity that you want to have that you don't necessarily need in fiction. I mean, fiction is is often ambiguous, whereas essays, at least to me, I, I tried to, you know, make them as clear as possible, which wasn't always easy. And I mean, another funny example of something was there's a this essay um, on an essay by Carlo Ginsburg about um, clues. It's called Clues. Um, wait, what's the actual title? Because it's really... Um, Roots of an evidential paradigm. Well, you know, I try to find uh, there are a lot of sort of, as I said before, in this uh, in the Calvino essays, there are a lot of essays responding to other essays or as book or book reviews. So the Carlo Ginsburg, I tried to find the English and English version, and in fact, I found two English versions <laughs> which did not agree. So there was <laughs> there was like <laughs> it was really so when he was quoting Ginsburg, I mean, or or just even. Um, paraphrasing, you know, here I was faced with two different interpretations already of the Italian, and then, of course, there would be my own. But anyway, that was, that was also like a funny little um, interesting problem. <laughs> you never know what kind of problem you're going to come up against. And, and uh, there was definitely some problems with terminology. You, know, well, you, you touched on some of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in, in, in Calvino's essays in particular. But he said something about the um, literary trends, for example, or literary concepts. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure, you know, like there are some, some of them, um, because he was very precise as well. Yeah. Um, but there are, I, I'm sure the political, the political um, language must have been quite hard. Well, yes. Um. But, but it's the same thing as we were talking about the literary things. I mean, you you really, I mean, at least to me, I, I don't know if everybody would feel this way, but I, I wanted to use a term that would be, rec if there was a recognizable term in English, I wanted to use it. I mean, if I didn't want to come up with something new that people would say, what what is this? And then, they say, oh, yeah, it's that thing we usually call whatever. Um, I mean, I think we discussed this, The one of the, um, impegnato was one of the difficult words, which is already a difficult word because it has so many meanings. But um, I think in the context, I decided to use engaged, I think engaged and disengaged, uh, because it seemed to me that that's what was used in similar contexts in English. Uh, I mean, I could be wrong. <laughs> well, no, you're, you're right, absolutely. But it probably, as you said, there is a problem. How does it ring to a contemporary audience? You know, like I'm yeah. Was one of the problems that 
that you had and you wanted to try and make them current and to make them um right <laughs> pleasant for and and, and enjoyable yeah. and understandable and, and yeah. uh, all these things together right and i mean in another another that sort of makes me think of another issue of the similar issue is that things change over time like i mean take a simple word like pasta uh you know in the past i think people would say i don't know noodles or or translated as spaghetti or uh, well not spaghetti is not a good example but uh, i don't know well a more a more common english word whereas now you can just say pasta so things like that cultural things do change i mean people are more are more sophisticated or more um they have a, a broader knowledge of other cultures a little bit you know just because of the internet and because of travel so you know there there are things like that that um you have to be aware of what's what's changed or what can or as i said before what can people look you know you can look up stuff some things online you can if you see a term that you don't know um i mean a re as a reader not not as a translator i mean so the translator doesn't have to maybe explain so many things as um you might once have had to do something that we often deal with with um students um is the is the um the desire on the part of the translator to explain every single thing yeah thing. oh but yeah resisting that is what separates uh, mm -hmm. uh, translation which kind of works from one which really works in my opinion mm -hmm. like, leave enough up to the reader to do some right. understanding by themselves they can often um be pulled into the text in the way that if you explain everything yeah right it makes too much of a surface or something that's yeah. projecting yeah but it also reminds me of um at the new yorker uh where i worked for many years um although i no longer do <laughs> um it's um we used to worry about I mean stuff like that cultural references change I mean and people's understanding but we used to have a joke about God the Judeo comma the Judeo-Christian deity comma you know is are you going to go there <laughs> <laughs> that's like as the extreme example of over explaining <laughs> so, but, it, but it's a delicate thing Yeah, I, I don't know if I want to um, read something else, but I, I just I have like really one I remember, you know, like I'm having a conversation with you about this, and I think it was very, very interesting about the issue of um, Calvino using specific gender, you know, when, oh. re when referring to, um, you know, always the masculine, of course, you know, like lettore, traduttore. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's something that, um, it, you know, sometimes was causing um, trouble, you know, like in, in, in the translation, right. in the translation. And, uh, and, and he, you know, within the context of trying to, to make the translation um, uh, also contemporary. Um, yeah. It was very difficult, wasn't it? And yeah. How, well, how did it, you solve that at, at the end? How did you well, solve I had different solutions, but... Um, which I'll get to in a second, but I just want to say it's you know it's kind of a problem in writing in general now, and and in in all in all translation sense, and in all writing and other kinds of writing. I mean, I'm a product of my of my time, <laughs> unfortunately. I almost would, would say a prisoner of my time, and so to be um, the he, the universal he he refer meaning, you know, human a human being, not not just a masculine he I mean that to me is natural but I have had to work to overcome that because it's not it's not right anymore I mean I I remember certain writers in a in a transitional moment would instead of using he would use she as a universal pronoun but that's not really satisfactory either because it's the same it's like it's like saying hey I'm not using he I'm using she um it's not really so you know, one of the solutions is is to make everything plural. I mean, that's the easiest. If you can, if that works, it doesn't always work. Um, another solution is to just, I don't know, repeat <laughs> repeat a name, or um, or names, or I don't know. I can't remember what the, the other solutions were. I, I think sometimes. I mean, you could say one, for example. Sometimes that works, but that's quite stiff, really, in English. Yes. Uh, very often 
So that's not such a great solution either. I mean, there isn't a good solution. <laughs> I mean, human being, you can't, that doesn't very often work. Yeah. Um, you had some other examples of what, of how it was resolved. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, like, well, I remember we talked about this, um, you yeah. know, sometimes, sometimes warmer. And uh, yeah. now I remember, you yeah. know, like, oh, well, what, what about humans? You know, this is yeah. something. Yeah, I mean, that's another way of doing it. But that's, but that also has a slightly anthropological tone, um, mm -hmm. which isn't always what you want. Um, I think you're right, because I think in the, at the end, you know, like the decision that you made, then some of the scientific texts, you know, like where, yes, yeah. Anthropology and and you know like you had yeah. to preserve uh, the the word you know like that it was used also right um, for historical historical reasons as well yeah. Mm. right yeah no um no but it's but it's complicated and and another um well for for um British English people speaking speaking people that's not so it's not so um grating but to me to use they as a singular pronoun I that that sort of bothers my ear. <laughs> but I mean, that's another solution that people that people use. Um, so yeah, there are, but it's it's not ideal. The language was not created right. <laughs> we need some we need some new pronouns. Did it bother I mean, you when Calvino used traduttore all the time? Which which is you know considering how um, gendered the whole profession used to be, so many yeah. people, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's kind of at, at odds with that uh, historical. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, Italian has a whole other level of, of that problem because of because it's so gendered. But um, but even in English, I mean, but in English, you yes, you could just say the translator, you wouldn't have to. But in Italian, of course, you you get into that problem. I mean, and I guess there you would you would tend to use a plural, try to use the plural more. Although even that isn't really ideal because it's the same problem. Yeah, well, the, the problem is, is, is that then the repetition of all these um, masculine pronouns because yeah. they're using the in Italian anyway. In Italian, yeah. not just il traduttore, but it was like lui and you know it, it's yeah the, and the uh, and, and the il suo. So it's it's just repeated. So 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 I kind of forced you in a sense to reword some of the sentences and had to. Yeah. Sentence. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the problem is for someone like me, as I said, I mean, I, you know, I grew up with a different, I, you know, different set of um, pronouns, <laughs> you could say, or a different idea about it. And so to me, it just seems it seems natural. And I don't read it as as gender, you know, to me, it just means a translator, let's say, I don't see it as man, male translator, but I don't think that's, I don't think I should do that. I mean, I think I, I have to make the effort, and I do make the effort to see it to see things in a newer cultural context um, or newer grammatical context, you could say. Uh, but um, but it's, it makes the translator's job harder. Uh, talk about the translator uh, text. Well, there was so much, we had a very lively debate about, <laughs> um, we had a lively debate before uh, you um, came online. Um, about the, um, the the famous letter to Claudio Gorlier, you know the essay on translation. Oh yeah, yeah. That um, um, on here I said that, that that it kind of was a concentrated folly on the side of uh, Calvino that was inspired to write that letter because he was very upset. Um, yeah. About, yeah. About um, the uh, criticism. Mm -hmm. um, Criticism that Gorlier um, uh, did to Passaggio in India, made to Passaggio in India, yeah. by Adriana Motti. Uh -huh. um, I'm wondering, I'm just wondering um, how you felt that uh, essay, uh, how do you feel that essay relates to contemporary issues that are being now discussed in the translation world or, or translation practice? Well, I mean, certainly the issue of um, reviewing translations. I mean, the, the issue of, of um, reviewing translations in the sense of reviewing the translation itself, which first of all doesn't happen that often, but it often is. Um, uh, well, <laughs> it's it's very picky. I mean, everybody makes mistakes, as Calvino says. I mean, there you know, you always, especially let's say in a big, long, complicated book, you're 
bound to make a mistake or you're bound to have a different opinion about something than the reviewer. And um, so it, I think it's complicated because it's, you know, it seems always seems very personal, of course, and, you know, it makes you paranoid to be, have your review. On the other hand, it's, it seems that it's important for a translation to be reviewed as a translation. I mean, because otherwise what's, I mean, people's writing is reviewed as writing. I mean, a novel is reviewed, the writing in a novel is reviewed. It seems like the writing in a translation should be reviewed, but then there's the whole issue of, should it be reviewed by someone who knows the language? Or should it be reviewed by someone who's just a reader and doesn't necessarily know the language? Um, you know, I, I don't, those are, those are questions that um, are hard to answer and, you, and to resolve. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Do you have a view? Do you tend to think uh, that it should fall um, a, a better review will be someone who has access to the source text or someone who doesn't? You know, I don't know. There's a, um, a you, I don't know if you know, there's a very well-known uh, editor in New York, Barbara Epler, who's the editor of New Direction. So she she edits a ton of translations and she knows she's a great editor and she doesn't know any other language. So, you know, there's something to be said, said for that. And, you know, in the other direction, if you, if for someone who knows the language, there could be, you could just get snagged on every, on, different things in every sentence that an, an, uh, a reader who doesn't know, but maybe there should be a place for both, obviously, you know, for, for, um, and for discussion of the, tra of a translation rather than just, you know, a review that has many reviews just have a, a par you know, like they'll have like a little paragraph at the end with a bunch of small criticisms. I mean, um, Michael Moore's translation, new translation of uh, Promessi Sposi just came out. And, you know, that happened, that there were several things where there was some review, I forget where, or just at the very, after praising the book and all the translation and all this, at the very end, there was like a paragraph of little criticisms. <laughs> so it's like, what, you know, what is that about, really? I mean, that just seems, I don't know, it just, um, it's difficult. Yeah. On the yeah. other hand, I just want to say one more thing about reviewing translations, which is that, uh, on the other hand, that that reviewers tend often not to even not to, I mean, to review as if they're not reviewing a translation. And there's like one 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 word about the translation, you know, I don't know whatever, good, bad, um, interesting, uh, you know, <laughs> thorough. I don't know the, all these, you know, kind of single words. Um, mm -hmm. But but then they go on to quote like big amounts of the of the writer, but but really what they're quoting, who they're quoting is the translator. And I think that's something that reviewers should pay attention to. I wonder whether someone who um, speaks both languages would be more inclined to acknowledge that this is one interpretation of that text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that I think that that's probably true. And that might be a good it's a good way to think about it. I mean, a good. Do, do, do you think that Calvino, in that essay at least, you know, like felt he acknowledged the fact that um, we have to give room to a variety of translations rather mm -hmm. than just the one? Do you think they did? I mean, how did, did that essay make you feel as a translator? Did you feel that Calvino was acknowledging the, ha the hard work of translators? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, something that um, doesn't get acknowledged that much. I mean, it does a little more than it used to, I think. But yeah, I think I think that he that he does. Um, and the fact that there, of course, there could be there's room for many translations of something. I mean, whoever it was that famous, you know, the famous sort of thing about if, if to, you really want to understand a poem in another language, you have to read five translations of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's particular. I mean, it's true of, po of prose too, but much, much more of poetry, because there's so many different ways you could interpret. I mean, you could approach. A po I mean, I have sworn off translating poetry. I just think it would be too hard. <laughs> we already have so many choices and ways of translating in prose. I, um, Jhumpa Lahiri once made some example of you know a man went into a bar and ordered a coffee. There were like a hundred ways you could write it. You could say it. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that's really your thing. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, should we take a couple of questions or maybe? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, 
Do you mind, Anne, if we take a couple of very concise uh, questions? Sure. From no, that's fine. We'll, we'll relay them. I uh, will relay. Yeah, yeah. okay. okay. Uh, there's one straight away. Someone's hand went straight up as soon as you mentioned questions. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, and it's John. Hello. And uh, one theme that has come out here again and again is Calvino is always writing up to the very limits of what he knows. He's trying to peer over into the unknowable. And the essays that I've seen in that collection, it's certainly a factor. He's grappling with something almost beyond, well, beyond expression. I know it's an impossible question, but can you talk about that when he's working at the limit of abstraction and of knowing? Did you hear? I think, yeah, um, yes, it's not an, un it's kind of an unanswerable question because, you know, in a way I was thinking as you're, as you were saying that, that, um, that really, that's what a translator is doing, you know, working at the limit of, of what's possible or what he, or, or of the knowable. And that's what you're always struggling with. You know, it's like, you're getting, the work of translation is getting into somebody else's mind. Um, and that's, uh, a kind of a scary prospect because you don't really know if you're reading it correctly. Um, if there is even a correct a correct way of reading someone's mind, but but that does um, I like that as a definition of what a translator's doing. <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe the microphone. Sorry. Oh, that's uh, a good idea. I'll run around with the microphone. <laughs> Um, hello, Anne. This is Joe Farrell. You may remember we met recently in New York at oh, the yes. events. Nice to see you again. Listen, can I push you a bit more? And it's maybe not something exactly in your experience. You were talking about the difficulties um, in modern translation when you keep coming across the masculine, uh, and you've mm -hmm. some very interesting comments on that. Can I widen this a wee bit? And as I say, I don't think it's on behalf. I'm afraid of the new censorship, by which I mean that if you're translating um, something from another time and you come across attitudes, racism, for example, anti-Semitism might be a possibility, mm -hmm. sometimes misogyny. Mark Twain, for example, is often accused, uh, often accused of racism. And the then comes a kind of pressure on editors, on publishers, and on translators, if you like, to censor the past, which means, in my opinion, that we then lose the accurate record of thinking at other mm -hmm. times. I wonder if you have any opinions. I'm not sure if you ex have any experience of this, but if you have any experience of how you've had to deal with what I call the new pressure for a new kind of censorship of other times, other cultures, other peoples, other attitudes, which we mm -hmm. know is tasteful. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes editors and or copy editors, editors, you know, they want to change. Uh, well, there's a pronoun question, which is difficult in any case. And you know, you're right. If it's if something is writ was written in a time when he uh, meant the universal he. Sometimes you just want to leave it because it's it's a sign it's a as you say you know it's it's historical you don't want to like change everything whitewash well not whitewash but just change everything but there are also this the questions of um, you know like words that are people want to censor words that they consider I don't know racist or anti-Semitic I wouldn't do that um, or 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 anti or misogynistic exactly somebody once queried some word like wanted to change a word, the word kingdom to, um, I don't know, something else. I just thought that's, now that's really, that's really extreme, but I would never, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't change, um, I wouldn't censor any kind of word that, whether it's historical or just in terms of the culture in general. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I would definitely avoid, I mean, try to fight against that. I, I I could see some nodding, so I think uh, <laughs> that's your your. Oh, good. Okay, it's so, a little hard because I can't see anybody. <laughs> unfortunately, we can't. Um, 
through that. Do, is there any, any other question there? Some silence. <laughs> Uh, this is all very interesting, but I'd love to hear a little bit more of your reading. Can we have a, can we have oh, our second our second reading? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, sure. So let's see where was it? Um, here. Oh yeah, this is the end of the essay. Um, why do I why do you write? Which was um, a question sent to a bunch of writers by um, Liberatz. Oh wait, I, I don't know how to say it in French. Liberation, <laughs> the um, Paris paper. So this is the end of Calvino's um, point. And actually, he 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 starts off by talking about Primo Levi's answers to the same question. So that was kind of great. <laughs> um, why do I write one? because I am dissatisfied with what I've already written and would like in some way to correct it, complete it, offer an alternative. In this sense, there wasn't a first time when I started writing. Writing has always been an attempt to erase something I've already written and replace it with something that I still don't know if I'll succeed in writing. Two, because this is, this is actually relevant about the, in terms of Calvino writing at the limits, um, to the, beyond the limits, trying to write what he doesn't know. <laughs> Too, because reading X, an old or a contemporary X, I have the thought, ah, how I'd like to write like X. Too bad it's completely beyond my capabilities. Then I try to imagine this impossible undertaking. I think of the book I will never write, but that I'd like to be able to read, to put beside other beloved books on an ideal shelf. And suddenly some words, some sentences appear in my mind. From then on, I am no longer thinking of X or of any other possible model. I'm thinking of that book, that book that hasn't yet been written and that could be my book. I try to write it. Three, to learn something I don't know. I'm referring now not to the art of writing, but to the rest, to some branch of knowledge or specific skill or that more general knowledge called life experience. It's not the desire to teach others what I know or think I know that makes me want to write, but on the contrary, the painful awareness of my incompetence. So would my first impulse be to write in order to pretend a competence I don't have? Hmm. <laughs> but in order to pretend, I have to somehow accumulate information, notions, observations. I have to succeed in imagining the slow accumulation of an experience. And this I can do only on the written page where I hope to capture at least some trace of a knowledge or wisdom that I just touched in life and immediately lost. Well, that really expresses the same thing. I mean, it's, it's also, um, when you read the, he, the the book reviews in this volume um, are interesting in a way. I mean, they're they're off. Some of them are about books actually that are still famous. I mean, like Levi Strauss, or at least I think <laughs> they're still famous. Um, but um, but a lot of them are about books that are quite obscure. But uh, but but Calvino's approach and his you know way of like trying to his his not he does have a ton of knowledge. I mean, he shouldn't undersell himself. Um, he knows about all these subjects and he and he gets into them in a way that's so that's really interesting. And, you know, even if you say, well, the books, who cares about these books, really, you do care what what Calvino is thinking about them and how he thinks about them. And that there's a wealth of um, definitely knowledge that come through, um, you know, like an, in its style too. So yeah. How, yeah. Um, you know, in the, in the earlier discussion, in the debate, um, and we said that um, all this knowledge of books and of the past, yeah. in a sense, comes through its style as well. Mm -hmm. and so that it kind of filters through um, his style and whatever he says, what he says you know, about books, about the people. But also when he writes a certain book, for example, The Bar in the Trees or The Invisible Cities and et cetera, mm -hmm. um, there is there might be some kind of mimicking style by another author, maybe you know, like part of the research that he's done in that particular period of time. Yeah. Um, um, and, and then there was the question of um, do we feel then that all this weight of the past might make that book dated, or that does it sound um, you know, did did it happen to you, for example, with some of the essays or with the Baron of the Trees? You think the language um, is kind of dated, sound kind of dated because uh, has all this 
um, um, layers of, no. uh, of books over it. I don't think so. I don't think it sounds dated. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, the translation, I, uh, as, a tra as in making the translation, of course, you don't want it to sound dated. And, you know, I hope it doesn't. And I hope that it doesn't. Um, I don't think it's uh, it, books tend not to sound dated in their original language. Uh, yeah, I mean, but translations do be. Kind of felt that maybe the language of Calvino might be dated to an Italian. So maybe I just like a didn't phrase it. Right? Maybe, maybe I don't know. I that I, it's hard for me to judge. Uh, you know, really. Part, like, I always felt, you know, with your essays that if some of the uh, essays um, uh, in in Italian, um, they're very militant, so they have that very very um, dated um, ideological. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In Italian, well, in English, no, they're kind of fresh and they feel you know, pleasant to. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> I mean, I, I much prefer reading them in English in a sense. Um, I have to say. I see I, what you mean, yeah. I know, you wouldn't like, have the weight of all the, of everything behind it in English, because you wouldn't know it. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. We have maybe just, uh, just one more question before we wrap up. I'd really be curious um, about uh, what you're working on at the moment. Can we have a little taste? Of what you're on at the um, actually, I'm working on Alba de Cespedes. Oh, that's uh, Nessuno torna indietro. Nessuno torna indietro. Um, yeah. I'm staring in the audience because Alba de Cespedes then is obviously the topic of someone's research at the moment. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, yes. She, I, I didn't know. I mean, you know, this is a little bit the Ferrante influence. You know, she she talks about Morante, about the Cespedes, about um, and various other uh, Ortese uh, writers who haven't been that much translated. Actually, the Cespedes has was translated in the 1950s, but not very well, and we're not very well. Again, you know, the translations are dated, but um, but but she sort of I think aroused an interest in these writers. Um, in Italy too, they're being relaunched. Oh, um, Marina Jar, uh, you know, writers who are sort of being republished in Italy as well, and then now being retranslated or translated for the first time in English. And I think that you know we have Fer Ferrante to thank for that, for yeah. finding, for rediscovering these writers. And you? <laughs> well, uh, for me, oh, it's you know, yeah. it's great. Um, but but is there any writer that you feel um, that maybe has been neglected and might be worth, apart from Alba de Cespedes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, do you have any, do you have a, a magic list? Of no, <laughs> I don't actually. I'm waiting for somebody to present me with the next <laughs> writer who is not known yet. <laughs> so see other people nodding in the audience so you might receive <laughs> some uh, yeah food. no I am always open <laughs> yeah brilliant yes well, it's been really interesting for me I've learned a huge amount oh thank you from the passage that you just read I I can't help but think he could be describing translation for a lot of the time he's mm -hmm. talking about writing but he could also be speaking about translation um so I'd like to thank you very much for joining us oh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, thank you. Room, I think. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would like to pass on the uh, greetings of um, uh, Marco Giacchini, uh, the head of the Italian Cultural Institute. Oh. oh. Thank you. And of the ambassador on his behalf. So thank you very thank much for joining us. You. I know how much you wanted to be here. And it's great to have the opportunity to have you um, on the screen. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to bringing you to Dublin exactly. on another occasion. I, I'll get there. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Brilliant. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.